I walked down in, or fell down into the rabbit hole 2014 when I started to work at CloudAMQP, uh, where we provide RabbitMQ as a service. My goal when I started to work at CloudAMQP was that I wanted to make it, make it more easy for everyone to get started with RabbitMQ. I wanted to bring simple use cases to the public and also point out all the benefits of using RabbitMQ. So I started to write technical documentations, update code examples, write blog posts, more blog posts, tutorials. I answered questions at Stack Overflow and uh, I also created two eBooks. So today, sometimes uh, when, when I'm at a bar having a beer or when I talk to unfamiliar people, I ironically call myself an influencer. And the life of a blogger and an influencer of this kind is almost as glamorous as you might think. You get spoiled with, spoiled with all kinds of luxury and you gotta hang out with important people. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's a dog trying to disturb me uh, because I work from home a lot. I have, during my time at CloudAMQP, replied to more than 3,000 emails about RabbitMQ, and I have, um, as Yuan just said, been part of the urgent support team, where we respond to urgent support issues, which could be when, when a client needs uh, attention directly, when a server is running out of memory, or when RabbitMQ is under heavy load. With all this writing, many things were documented. Uh, I met up with different customers to see how they are using RabbitMQ, I, and I wrote down lots of common use cases. We collected anti-patterns, errors we see in setups, configuration mistakes, and all sorts of common mistakes that we see. Things that can go wrong and things that works out well. So what kind of issues are we dealing with then? First of all, we have uh, client-side problems, uh, where users like you and me, or client libraries, are using RabbitMQ in a bad way. And then we have uh, situations where things are just not done in an optimal way, way. And then, of course, we have the server side. Uh, servers running old versions, misconfigured servers, or when the setup of the server is not configured for a selected use case. So I will today spread the knowledge and talk about what we have learned from running thousands of RabbitMQ nodes. But before we go into all the things I have already written down all over the internet, my name is Louisa, and I'm from Umeå, Sweden. Um, I, uh, I do work at 84 Codes, which is the provider of Cloud AMQP. I work as marketing manager and support engineer and lots in between. Uh, I have a growing family of uh, lovely colleagues, and many of them are with me here today. And they are always happy to talk, so come by and talk to us in our booth downstairs. 84 Codes is also the provider of three other services. Cloud Kafka, which is Apache Kafka as a service, Elephant SQL, Postgres SQL as a service, and the hosted message broker for AM, uh, IoT, which is named the Cloud MQTT. We work remote from all over the world, and we also have customers from all over the world, but we have our headquarters in Stockholm. Uh, we are today the largest provider of managed RabbitMQ servers with uh, lots of run tons of thousands of running instances in seven clouds in 75 regions. And I will now give some recommendations where some is equal to 16. Um, and I will also give a summary of all these recommendations in the end of this presentation. And I know I will repeat lots of things that has already been said today. Uh, but I did not really have time to rewrite my slides. Uh, so recommendation number one, try to keep a connection and channel count low. Each connection uses about 100 kilobytes of RAM, and of course even more if TLS is used. So thousands of connections could, could be a heavy burden on a, on a RabbitMQ server. So uh, if, especially if you're running on a small instance. And believe it or not, uh, connection and channel leaks is one of the most common errors that we see. But luckily, it's mostly on staging and dev servers. Number two, make sure you don't open and close connections or channels repeatedly. Doing that gives you a higher latency as more TCP packages has to be sent and received. And the handshake process of an AMQP connection is as mentioned before. 
uh, quite involved and requires at least seven TCP packages. And again, even more if TLS is used. Uh, RebitMQ is optimized for a long-lived connection. So keep connections if you are able to and re keep them open and uh, reuse them if you are able to. Channels can be opened and closed more frequently, but even channels should try to be long-lived if possible. And best is to not open a channel every time you're publishing. Each process should ideally uh, only create one TCP connection and use multiple channels uh, in that connection for different threads. And we deal with servers that are under heavy load due to opening and closing of connections almost every week. Some clients can't keep long-lived connection to the server, and this has, as I said before, an impact of latency. Uh, one way to avoid connection churn uh, is to use a proxy that pulls connections and channels for reuse. And we have developed an AMQP proxy for this. And our benchmarking showed that, uh, that proxy is increasing publishing speed with a magnitude or more. Uh, and there is a link to the GitHub repo in the slides. We are developing in many different languages. Uh, and this proxy is developed in Crystal, which we are also a really proud sponsor of. Number three, uh, one should always separate connections for publish and consume. First of all, imagine what will happen uh, if you are using the same connection for publisher and consumer when the connection is in flow control. The flow control connection uh, uh, a flow controlled connection is a connection that is being blocked and unblocked several times per second in order to keep the rate of messages at the speed that the rest of the server can handle. A publisher and consumer on the same connection might worsen this, pro, uh, this flow control uh, since you might not be able to consume messages when the connection is being blocked. Secondly, RabbitMQ can apply back pressure on the TCP connection when the publisher is sending too, mes too many messages to the server. And if you can see Zoom on the same TCP connection, uh, the server might not receive the message acknowledgement from the, from the client. And so the consumer performance is affected too. And with lower consumer speed, the server might be overwhelmed after, after a while. I will start to speak Swedish. As I said, I'm Swedish. Uh, and if you know something about Sweden, except Swedish Fika, then it might be that we love queuing. What we don't like is large queues or when people in some way try to squeeze us in before you in the line. So recommendation number four comes straight from my heart. Uh, if it's used your use case, try keeping your queue as short as possible. A message published to an empty queue will go straight out to the consumer uh, as soon as the queue receives the message. And of course, a persistent message also will be written to disk. It's recommended to have less than 10,000 messages in a queue. And many messages in a queue can also put a heavy load on the RAM usage. And in order to free up RAM, RabbitMQ starts flushing or page out messages to disk. And this uh, page out process usually takes time and blocks the queue from processing mes messages when there are many messages to page out. Uh, another thing that is bad with, with large queues is that it's time consuming to restart a cluster with many queues, since the index has to be rebuilt, and uh, it's also it also has to, it's also time consuming to sync messages between nodes in the cluster. Large queues is also a very very common error that we have uh, for our, uh, that our customers have. Uh, a queue is just piling up due to missing consumers, or due to that clients are publishing messages faster than the consumers able to handle the messages. And then eventually, the server is overloaded and killed. Uh, and when this happens, we usually add up more power to the, those machines. And uh, but it still takes time to restart the cluster because, yeah, because of the rebuilding of the indexes, etc. Uh, it's sometimes recommended uh, for applications that often get hit by, by spikes of messages and where throughput is more important than anything else to set the max length on the queue, uh, because this key keeps the queue short by discarding messages from the, from the head of the queue. Number five, uh, a feature called lazy queue was added in uh, RebitMQ 3.6. Uh, 
and LazyQ uh, writes messages immediately uh, to disk. And so spreading the work out over time instead of taking a risk of a performance hit somewhere down the road. Messages are only loaded into memory when they are needed and thereby the RAM usage is minimized, but the throughput time will be longer uh, with lazy queues. So lazy queues gives you a more predictable and smooth performance curve without any sudden drops, but at the cost of a little overhead. And if you're sending many messages at once, like if you're processing batch jobs, or if you think that your consumer will not keep up uh, with the speed of the publisher all the time, then we recommend to enable lazy queues. And uh, we think that you can ignore lazy, lazy queues if you require high performance, or if you know that your queue will always stay short due to uh, max length policy or something like that. Number six, uh, the RevDem queue management interface collects and calculates metrics for every queue connection and channel in the cluster. And setting RevDem queue management statistic rate mode to detailed could have a serious performance impact uh, and should not be used in production uh, if you have thousands upon thousands of active queues or consumers. Recommendation number seven. Queues are single threaded in RabbitMQ, and one queue can handle up to 50,000 messages a second. Uh, you will. Um, oh, I'm losing my voice. You will therefore get better performance if you split your queues over different cores and nodes, and uh, if you route messages between multiple um, multiple queues. And queues are bound to the node where they are first declared. So all messages routed to a specific queue will end up on the node where that queue resides. And you can, of course, manually split queues evenly between nodes, but the downside is that you need to remember where, where that queue is located. And we recommend two plugins that can help you if, if you have multiple nodes or, or a single node cluster with, with multiple cores. And it's the consistent hash exchange plugin and RabbitMQ sharding. Uh, the consistent exchange plugin has been mentioned a lot today. Um, and the plugin allows you to use an exchange to load balance messages between queues. So messages sent to an exchange are consistently and equally distributed across many bounded queues. And it could quickly become hard to do this manually without adding too much information about number of queues and their bindings into the publishers. Uh, and note that it's important to consume from all queues bounded to the exchange when, when using this plugin. The sharding plugin, uh, the RabbitMQ sharding, does the partitioning of queues automatically for you. So once you have defined and exchange is sharded, uh, the supporting queues are automatically created on every cluster node and message, messages are sharded across them. And sharding shows one queue to the consumer, but it could be many queues running beh behind it in the background. And then we have priorities. Queues can have uh, zero or more priorities, and behind the scenes of a priority queue, a new backing queue is created. So each priority level uses an internal queue on the Erlang virtual machine, which takes up some resources. And using 255 or even thousands of priorities means you will have resource usage, usage similar to having close to that many queues. Uh, and in most use cases, it's sufficient to have no more than five priority levels. This is uh, fixed in RebsMQ 3.7.6. Uh, the max priority cap uh, for queues is now enforced to, and set to 255, and applications uh, that rely on a higher number of priorities will break, and such application must be updated to use no, no more than 255 priorities. Because um, we had, like, uh, two weeks ago, or maybe three weeks ago, a case where two consumers were, uh, were starting up RabbitMQ, and it took a really long time, and memory usage just exploded, as you can see there. Uh, and uh, this was despite few queues and few messages, which is the common, common error when it takes a long time to restart a broker. But this time it was due to 
uh, many priorities le priority levels. Everyone needs to be prepared for broker restarts, broker hardware failure, or server crashes. And to ensure that messages and broker definitions survive restarts, we, know to, we need to know that, ensure that they are on disk. And messages, exchanges, and queues that are not durable and persistent are lost during a broker restart. So make sure that your queue is declared as durable and messages are, dis uh, are sent with delivery mode persistent. And remember, persistent messages are heavier uh, as they have to be has to be written to disk. So for high performance, it's better to use transit messages and temporary or non-durable non queues. And then we have the prefetch, uh, which is used to specify how many messages that is sent uh, to the consumer and cached by the uh, RevDMQ client library, how many messages the client can receive before acknowledging a message. And it's used to get as much out of, of the consumer as possible. And RevDMQ default prefetch setting gives clients an unlimited buffer, meaning that RevDMQ by default uh, sends as many messages at it, as it can to any consumer that looks ready to receive them or accept them. And messages that are sent or cached by the, as I said, the RevDMQ client library in the consumer until it has been processed. So not setting a prefetch can lead to clients running out of memory and makes it impossible to scale out with more consumers. In RevitMQ, we got uh, RevitMQ 3.7, we got a new option to adjust the default prefetch value, and this value is by default set to 1,000 on, um, on all new Cloud and QP servers with, with version 3.7 or, or higher. Or it doesn't really exist yet, but soon. Uh, a too small prefetch count may hurt performance since it's most of the, ta of the time waiting for permissions to send more messages. Uh, and this figure is illustrating a long idling time. In the example, we have a prefetch setting of one, and this means that RabbitMQ won't send out the next message until the round trip completes, where, where a round trip is deliver, process, and acknowledge. Uh, and we have in this image an, a total round trip time of 125 milliseconds with a processing time of only 5 milliseconds. So a uh, too low value will keep the consumer, in, uh, consumer idling a lot since, since they need to wait for messages to arrive. A large prefit count, count, on the other hand, uh, could deliver lots of messages to one single consumer and keep that consumer busy while other consumers are, are he held in idling state. And in this image, we have um, one client that is, has a let, lot to do, and one that is just waiting and has nothing to do. So if you have one single or few consumers and are processing message quickly, we recommend prefetching many message, messages at once and try to keep your client as busy as possible. And if you have about the same processing time all the time uh, and the, the network behavior remains the same, you can use the total round trip time divided by processing time on the client for each message to get the estimated prefetch value for each message. And if you have many consumers and short processing time, we recommend the lower prefetch value than for a single or few consumer. And finally, if you have many consumers and or long processing time, um, we recommend setting prefetch count to one so that messages are evenly distributed among all your workers. And here's another thing that you should remember, that's, it's that your client, if your client out -like messages, the prefetch value have no effect. Hype uh, increases servers throughput at the cost of increased startup time. So when you enable hype, RabbitMQ is compiled at startup, and this throughput increases uh, with 20 to 80% according to benchmark tests. The drawback of hype is that, it's, that startup time increases quite a lot too, one to three minutes, uh, and it's therefore not recommended uh, if you require high availability due to this long startup time. We don't consider Hype as experimental any longer. 6% uh, of our clusters has Hype enabled, and uh, we haven't seen issues with Hype for a really long time. 
acknowledgments uh, let the server and client know if, if the message has to be retransmitted again. And the client can either act the message uh, when it receives it or when the client uh, has completely processed the message. So uh, pay attention uh, to where in your uh, consumer log logic you're acknowledging messages. A consuming applic application that receives uh, essential messages should not acknowledge messages until it has uh, finished whatever it needs to do with them. Uh, so that unprocessed messages don't go missing in case of worker crashes, exceptions, etc. And the acknowledgement has a performance impact. Uh, so for the fastest possible throughput, manual acts should be disabled. Publish confirm uh, is the same thing, but for publishing, and the server acts uh, when it has received a message from the publisher. Publish confirm also has a performance impact, um, but however, once you keep in mind that it's required if the publisher needs messages to be processed at least once. Thanks to the RebitMQ team, great improvements are made all the time, which is really great. Uh, in 3.7, we got the de default prefetch, uh, as I just mentioned, and this will probably completely remove cases where the consumer has been killed due to, uh, to a too large message delivery due to an unlimited, unlimited prefetch value. And individual vhost message stores are now available, and this helps us at CloudMQP a lot. Because uh, we have two subscription plans that are shared plans, which gives a customer a single vhost on a multi-tenant server. And this means that uh, our shared plans can be even more, more stable. And even if you have multiple vhosts on a dedicated plan, it will also be more stable. Uh, RabbitMQ 3.6 uh, had a new feature, Lazy Queues, that gave many of our customers a more predictable and stable cluster. And we found the Lazy Queue feature so good that all our new uh, clusters with RabbitMQ version 3.6 or larger are, uh, has uh, Lazy Queues enabled by default. Uh, many of our customers with issues are running old versions or, uh, or documented unstable versions. And 3.6 had many memory problems up to version 3.6.14. And 3.5.7 was good, but lacks some good features like, like the lazy queue feature. And we still have lots of servers running 3.5. And this is the image, it's a RebitMQ version distribution between Cloud and QP customers. And it's nice to see that so many has upgraded to 3.7 because it's always something we try to push to, like we, we want our customers to run old stable, new stable versions. Uh, and we t always test new versions before that we set them as available versions in uh, Cloud and QP. So uh, the, the menu that, that is selected in our drop-down menu in, on the page where you select which version you want to run, that, that, that uh, is the version we recommend at the moment. So this recommendation is stay up to date with things that is happening in RabbitMQ and stay up, uh, use a stable version and also a stable airline version and a stable client library version. Some plugins might be super nice to have, but on the other hand, they might uh, consume a lot of resources. Therefore, they are not recommended in production servers, so make sure to disable plugins that you are not using. Uh, an example of a plugin that we are using a lot, but that we are disabling every time, every time we are finished using it, is, is the top plugin, which we are using when we are troubleshooting RabbitM, uh, RabbitMQ servers for our customers. Number 15, uh, even unused queues takes up some resources. Queue index, management statistics, etc. Uh, so, and leaving temporary queues can eventually cause that uh, RebitMQ runs out of memory. So make sure you, that you don't leave unused queues left behind and set temporary rare queues as auto-delete, exclusive, or auto-expire. 
Many of our customers are creating vHosts, uh, custom vHosts, and then they forgot to add uh, HI policy on the, the new vHost, and which caused message loss during net splits. Um, and we also we have an HI policy on all our clusters, even single node clusters, because uh, we're using that when uh, when customers are upgrading upgrading to new versions, or if they want to change from to node cluster, to a three node cluster, we use that. And if they want to upgrade the RevDemQ versions, etc. And here is a summary of it all. Uh, try to have short queues, use long-lived connection, have limited use of priority queues, use multiple queues to consumers, and split your queues over different cores. Use a stable airline and RevDemQ version, and also client library version. Disable plugins you're not using. Have channels on all your connections. And separate connections for publisher and consumer. Don't set uh, management statistic rate mode, mode to detailed in production. Delete you unused queues and set temporary queues as auto-delete. And for those of you who are interested in recommendation for high performance, then we, this is even more important with, with short, short queues and use a max length if, you're pos if possible. Do not use lazy queues. Send transit messages. Disable manual acts and publish confirms. Avoid mul multiple nodes. Uh, enable RevitMQ hype. And for those who are more interested in high availability, enable lazy queues. Have two nodes and don't forget to add the HA policy. Use persistent messages to durable queues and do not enable hype. And the last one is due to this long startup time. We have created a diagnostic tool that is available from the CloudIMP QP control panel uh, where customers can validate the setup, RevDemQ setup, and get a score of this setup. And it's been used by many customers and it's nice to have when we, when we get a support request, we could check this one first and then always get back to customer and say you need to fix this, 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 and this. And uh, then the server is all, uh, usually running much better after that. And here are example of, examples of things that are validated in diagnostic, this diagnostic tool. And I think I've talked about many of them, but not all of them. Uh, and just come down and talk to us if you want to see, see, if you want to see it. As we have seen, best practice recommendations uh, are different for different use cases, and some applications require high throughput, while other applications are publishing batch jobs that can be delayed for a while, and other applications just need to have lots of connections, and trade-offs have to be done bet between performance and guaranteed message delivery, etc. And our customers are today able to select number of nodes when they are creating a cluster, a single node for high performance, and two or three nodes, mainly for high availability and or consist, uh, uh, consistency. We also have lots of other features built in into the Cloud Cubic control panel, like the option to configure alarms uh, for queue links or for missing uh, consumers, etc. And users can view uh, how many messages there has been in the queue over time, uh, which helps us a lot when we are troubleshooting uh, our servers since uh, statistics for the queues are available all the time. And we also have show metrics for usage like CPU, RAM, and the disk. Uh, and we have some, seen many different use cases and our future plan at Cloud AMQP is to make it even easier for customers to quickly set up a cluster specified for a selected use case based on best practice recommendations. This is my final slide. Uh, and it would be nice if we could have a list like this uh, in the community, like a list of recommendations, because it makes, it makes it so much easier for beginners to start using RabbitMQ. So if you have any recommendations of things that we need to add, uh, or if you have different opinions about something, just let me know or send me an email or reach out to me. Thanks.